summarize. The sun's motion, number one, has almost always been called time. Usually when people use the word time, they're referring to the sun's motion. The hour hand's motion is number two. The minute hand's motion is number three. The solar second is 4a and the atomic second is 4b. While the sun's motion has almost always been what we've called time, physicists now regard the motion of the atomic second as time. That is what they are using now, the motion of the atomic second. Earlier I said the sun's motion is a bad motion. From a physics point of view, all of these motions are bad. They are all bad because they are slow. This is extremely important. When you think about this, it makes sense, common sense. The motion we call time is our standard of motion. This motion is defined on a clock. The hands on a clock move. Imagine that you have a battery powered wristwatch. If the battery on your wristwatch dies, if the hands on your wristwatch stop moving, then common sense tells you your timepiece is not working. The hands on your timepiece need to move. In essence, motion is one of the essential traits of time. What is another essential trait of time? Imagine this. Imagine that the hands on your wristwatch are slowly speeding up or gradually slowing down. If the hands on your timepiece do not move at a constant quantity of motion, then you'll discover your timepiece is not keeping time correctly. To be a good standard of motion, all of our timepieces must have the same motion. Yours, mine, everyone's timepiece has to move at, with the same motion. A timepiece that speeds up or slows down is bad. In essence, it is essential time has a constant quantity of motion. Constancy of motion is an essential trait of time. Even as a child, I knew this. This is a simple idea. That is why I immediately reacted badly when, in my high school physics class, the teacher said, according to relativity, time can speed up and slow down. I know this also makes sense to you. The hands on your timepiece must be moving, and they must have a constant quantity of motion. If you have learned to use time in everyday life, then this will be obvious to you. If the clock next to your bed says it is 7 a.m. when everyone else's clock says it is 7.45 a.m., if your clock is slowing down, then you will quickly discover the error. If this is such an obvious part of our lives, then why did the physicists of Einstein's time give up and buckle under? Why did they cave in? Initially, they reacted badly to relativity, but eventually they caved. In my opinion, they caved because they did not understand time. Here's an obvious question. Let me ask it. It is simple. How can you move one particular motion without it being a different motion? On this clock, there is a motion. If I move this clock, the motion on the clock combines with the motion of the clock and you get a different motion. So again, how can you move one particular motion without it being a different motion? You can't. That is why Einstein had to come up with relativity. The reason, according to relativity, that a clock must slow down as it approaches the speed of light is to correct for the error of having a moving clock. It's just that simple. When you move a traditional clock, which supposedly represents your standard of motion, it then has a different motion. In relativity, there is one critical chunk of math. I refer to it as a correction factor. It is in all of the central equations of relativity. It is this. Personally, I think of this as Einstein's correction factor. To be accurate, though, it was originally developed by the Dutch physicist Hendrik Lorenz, and its inverse 
is known as the Lorentz factor or the Lorentz term. Actually, this chunk of math goes all the way back to Pythagoras. At its essence is nothing more than an application of the Pythagorean theorem. This little bit of math corrects for the historical problem of using a wrong standard of motion for improperly defining time, for us measuring everything relative to the sun's motion. Let me summarize a detail by giving an analogy. When I first heard time slows down as you approach the speed of light, I immediately knew that this was somehow wrong. This is the analogy. This was like walking down a dark alley and suddenly seeing a bright neon sign in the shape of an arrow just at the moment when the neon sign is turned on. For me, this bright arrow was pointing at a door. Obviously, a sign like that gets your attention. Then what? If this happened to you, what would you do? You go up to the door and pull a handle, but it is locked. What is the trick? How do you unlock it and open the door? Well, the sign on the door is called time. What I'm about to show you is the trick that unlocks the door. This is the key that unlocks the door to time. Once the door is unlocked, we can stroll to the center of the physics labyrinth. It took me four years from the spring of 1979 to the spring of 1983 to figure out how to unlock that door. In 1983, on March 23rd, what I visualized was this. Again, here's an animation of this idea. Here we have two spheres. The outer sphere is expanding at the speed of light. The inner sphere is expanding at some sublight speed, V. The value of this speed doesn't matter. It just needs to be slower than the maximum speed. There's a difference between them. It is this difference. This difference is our error. What I realized was this factor, Einstein's correction factor in relativity, is this difference. You can derive this chunk of math directly from this geometrical relationship. Just use the equation for a circle. Again, this equation is nothing more than the Pythagorean theorem. This might not seem like a big deal, but it is. When I visualized the solution, it was truly exciting. I immediately knew it was a key that unlocked the door to time. I knew I had stepped through a door and was the first to see physics that nobody else had ever seen. I immediately knew this simple idea solved the mystery of time. It was truly an exciting moment. Look again. Think about the V in this correction factor. This velocity is the motion that represents time. That V might represent the sun's motion or any of the motions on a timepiece, on a traditional timepiece that is, where time is moving slower than the speed of light. However, if time is defined to travel at the speed of light, if this V is a C, then there is no error. This chunk of math is not needed. Let me be explicit. If we define time to be the speed of light, then this correction factor is not needed. It is easy to see. You would end up with the velocity squared becoming the speed of light squared, leading to a useless square root of 1 minus 1. It is a simple fact. Any motion slower than the speed of light is a bad definition for time because if you move a traditional timepiece, it has a different motion. It develops an error. By using relativity, you can correct for the error. However, relativity does not remove or fix the error. What is the solution? Now let me ask you, isn't it obvious how to fix this problem? Yes, all we have to do is redefine our definition for time to always be the fastest known motion. 
At this point in history, we call the fastest known motion the speed of light. Now, if you have ever been curious about the idea of time travel, then this might disappoint you. This next point is critical for anyone that has dreamt of time travel. If at some future point in history, we discover a motion faster than the speed of light, then time should be redefined to be that faster motion. That means time travel is and will always be impossible by definition. To summarize, we must redefine our beginning definition for time to be identical to nature's speed limit to be what we now call the speed of light. That is why I call it the speed of light definition of time.